This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. And I am so thankful. Y'all can take a seat. So thankful for years of friendship and ministry with the Dorches. Gosh, they're a blessing to us. I was, uh, I was watching a show recently, and, uh, and it was about a family that had, was coming to the United States for the first time, and they were at this really big memorial weekend cookout, and it was just this awesome celebration, and the teenage son looks at his mom and says, this party's amazing. What are we celebrating? And she goes, fallen soldiers? And he goes, oh, that's actually really sad. And it's, it's an easy thing to, to miss on a weekend that, that we're celebrating, um, but one of the things that we are called to do as believers is to rejoice and celebrate with those who are rejoicing and celebrating and to mourn with those who are mourning. And so it's easy to miss in, in the fun and the cookouts and the picnics and Memorial Day weekend that this is also a time of grief um, for a lot of people as they're mourning those that they've lost who've died in service to this country. So I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that, a moment for silence, uh, just to say thank you to the Lord um, for their sacrifice and to, to grieve with those who are grieving. So let's just take a moment. Lord, we thank you for the chance to worship you in this place, um, to gather together and, uh, and to celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, and we also grieve with, with those who are grieving in mourning, and, and we thank you for their sacrifice as well. We love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a sophomore in high school, um, I, I had this dream that I wanted to play linebacker for my high school football team. I wanted it so badly. And I, I talked to the, the coach that was over that at our team, and I said, what's it going to take? And he looked at me with, with sadness in his eyes. <laughs> and he said, Nick, no one is going to set foot on that field for our team that doesn't run this speed. And, and you, you are just not that fast. And, uh, and so that actually kind of lit something inside of me. But I had a problem. I thought speed was just this pure, magical thing that you either were born with or you weren't. And I was like, it, there's, there's no way possible. That, like, I need to shave this much time off my 40 time. It just can't be done. And, and my mom told me about this guy who was a track coach who also trained people at the gym she worked out with. I said, let's talk to him. Let, let's see if he can help you. And when I met him, he looked at me with a different look in his eyes. He looked, I, I think hunger is the best way I can describe it. And he said, oh, we're gonna make you faster. And that was that summer of three day a week workouts with him, with Ruben, were, were the most, that was the most grueling season of exercise in my life. The things that he had me doing um, to grow and get faster. And something crazy happened as I, as I did these workouts, something that I thought was this magical thing that could, could never be a, 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 a obtained that I thought there was nothing I could do to change, suddenly started changing in me. I actually started growing when I was following his plan for getting faster. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I can think that like being a godly person is just something that happens to you. Some people are born with it and some people aren't. And I look at the things that are happening inside of me as I struggle and I can't imagine how I could ever be different that something's just gonna have, like I'm not just get struck with something to change. And the amazing thing is the New Test, in the New Testament is God did not leave us on our own to fumble trying to figure out how to grow. He actually showed us how we can grow and change and he gave us a path for getting there. We read Galatians um, chapter five and it says there in, in verse 16, Paul said, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What does that mean? So, first of all, there's that word walk. It's an interesting idea that we can pass over. When we read the Bible, and it talks about what it looks like to be a Christian, to be a Jesus follower, there are two words that show up over and over again. One of them is walk, and the other is the way. Now, think about that. When they described the earliest Jesus followers, the, name, the kind of name of their religion they didn't have a name like Fellowship Bible Church or Fellowship Mosaic. They weren't called the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem or the First United Methodist Church of Antioch. They had a name, and the name was The Way. 
They named their church the way, and the word they used to describe what they did was walk. What does that tell you? That the name of their church was the way, and the thing they did was walk. You see, following being a Jesus follower is more than, it's certainly something to believe. It's certainly true good news for us to believe, but it's actually a new way to live because of those beliefs. It is a new way to walk. And the reason that walk, I think the reason that word walk is used is walking is something incredibly ordinary, right? Like walking is something very regular that we do throughout our life to get to where we're going. And so the description here is, hey, in a very ordinary everyday life, we're gonna change the way you walk, the way you get around and do things, and that's gonna be changed by walking with the Holy Spirit that God gave everyone who's following Jesus to change. And what happens when you start walking with the Spirit? Now, this is another phrase that's a little odd and might sound weird to us. It says you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, what does it mean to gratify the desires? A desire is when you want something and you gratify it when you say, yeah, I'm gonna go get it. I'm gonna go get the thing I want, right? There are, there are fruit snacks in the back in a little pile and I just kept walking by and grabbing another bag and I wasn't even thinking about it. It was automatic and I went through three bags of fruit snacks before service tonight. It's a problem. And that gratifying desire is when you just see something, you want it and you take it. And Paul says there are some desires in us that comes from what he calls the flesh, And what Paul means by the flesh, the flesh is kind of Paul's code word to describe all the things that we want that go against God's best for us. When we want something other than what God wants for us. And he says that when you start walking with the Spirit, you actually will stop reaching for and grabbing those things that your flesh desires. You'll stop grabbing for those things that don't please God and aren't good for you. And he says, it's really interesting. When he says you won't gratify the desires of the flesh, he says the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit, the spirit what's contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other. You know what the word conflict means? Conflict's a fight. Now, in some ways, when we start following Jesus, there's new peace that comes into our life, the peace of knowing him. But in other ways, starting to follow Jesus means there's a new fight in our life. There's a fight going on between the part of us that that wants sinful and bad things and the spirit of God who's pulling us somewhere else. You ever seen the old cartoons where there's like the good angel and the bad angel on your shoulder? It's actually remarkably accurate. That is really what the Christian life is like, except for the good angel is actually the Holy Spirit and the bad angel is the dark parts of me that desire something else. And there's this pull happening inside of us I remember when I was in elementary school, they were trying to, there was this anti-drug campaign and they would, they would they had this phrase, just say no to drugs. And, and I thought that was kind of funny because the idea was like, that's all it takes really. Just, just say no and everything will be fine. And I don't think the campaign was super successful because apparently we aren't always able to just say no to what's gonna be bad for us. Something actually has to change inside of us. And Paul's saying, hey, there's this war going on between the spirit pulling you one way and the flesh pulling you another way. Further down, in verse 22, Paul says, hey, this is what it looks like when the spirit starts changing you. You're gonna look a certain way. You're gonna be a person who is marked by love and peace and forbearance, which is another word for patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I don't know about you, but I would love my life to be marked by that. That's what happens when the Spirit's inside of you and working in you. But the question is, how do we get there? How does that transformation actually take place? Look at the very end. In verse 23, he says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Somehow, the way that we are gonna change is gonna happen when we start a different kind of walking and we start walking with the Spirit. And as we do that, even if it is really slow and really tedious, God's gonna start changing some things inside of us. It's not something we can accomplish on our own. Just like that summer, if I had wanted to go out and get faster on my own, I didn't have the ability to do it. I actually needed a trainer to exercise with me 
to do the exercises with me, to, to push me to grow. And he challenged me and he helped me to grow. And, and Paul's saying the Holy Spirit of God walks with us as we start growing. But I'm, I'm a really practical guy and I'm still going, okay, that's all good and well. What does that actually look like? How do we actually know what the Spirit is doing? How do we actually know how to walk with the Spirit? I don't, the, J- Jesus said the Spirit is like the wind. Nobody knows where he's going. And I'm going, well, if we don't know where he's going, how are we supposed to keep step with him? How are we supposed to walk with, with the Holy Spirit that we can't see? That's always really bothered me. And, and recently, I, I was studying, getting ready to teach on a passage in John 14 that completely transformed my understanding of this. It's when Jesus was promising to send the Spirit. To, he's talking to his disciples, and this is what he said. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Now that verse stumped me. He lives with you and will be in you. Here's why it stumped me. God hadn't sent the spirit to the disciples yet. So how could Jesus say they already know the spirit? What did it mean that the spirit lived with them? And I started studying, and one teacher pointed this out as I was reading about it. He said the Spirit lived with them because the Spirit was in Jesus. If they wanted to know what the Spirit looked like, all they had to do was look at the life of Jesus. So do you know how we find out what the walk of the Spirit looks like? We look at the life of Jesus. We practice the things that Jesus practiced. He is our model. He's the one we look to, and the Spirit helps us. He comes alongside us in that walk. So being led by the Spirit is not that there's some secret plan that that God is like holding from us and we need to to have it unlocked. It's not some new information about walking that we need. It's actually the Spirit of God helping us to imitate Jesus and to walk like him. So this summer, as a church, we're going to enter into a big experiment to go, what would it look like to commit a summer to practicing the kinds of things that Jesus did daily to try to really keep in step with some choices that by faith we will follow the way of Jesus and keep in step with the Spirit. That's what this rhythm series is all about, is establishing some new ways of walking that the Spirit empowers and that we see in the life of Jesus. So here's our walk away for tonight. Here's the challenge I want to give all of us in this room. Summer for me, kids, I don't know if you feel this, summer for me is usually like the least normal time of my year and I have the least discipline and routine ever. What would it look like if this summer was different? If we made a commitment as a church to get these rhythms books and to commit not only to to listen to sermons and, and read stories, but actually to practice the practices we're gonna look at at a church together. To trust, just like I had to trust that trainer that he knew how to make me faster, What if we trusted the Spirit of God that he knows how to grow us, how to transform us to be more like Jesus by walking in the ways that Jesus modeled for us and trusting the Spirit to be at work in our hearts? Can we do that together this summer? Can we commit as a church to to give this summer to trying to keep in step with the Spirit in his ways, the ways of Jesus with his power working in us? Lord, that's our desire because we wanna change. We wanna grow We want to have that fruit of the Spirit inside us that shows the marks of Jesus. And we know that we can't do it on our own, but that you have sent the Holy Spirit of God to transform us. So we love you, Lord, and we commit this summer to you.